All right, let's get started. Welcome. So, since we're going on a very fast pace because we're in a quarter system, we're going to have to do some changes around the course portal. So, in other words, this week, you all, you're no longer going to work through the course portal. You're only going to use it to submit your work. And there won't be... So, what we're doing is, since... We're ahead of the actual course right now. They haven't, the engineers haven't been able to finish updating the new units. So we're gonna have to sort of um, shorten it, condense all that we, we have to turn in in these weeks into just one milestone. That way you guys don't have to turn in everything like every, every day, because that's why I was planning to have you guys turn in like one day here, one day here, another day here. So that, yeah, that's kind of horrible. So I was talking to the CEO and my boss, and uh, we we managed to create um, something for this week, and as well as a final submission for your milestone next week. So for this week, you will be working on this. Um, I think I sent this yesterday. Yeah. If you didn't get it, check your email. I sent an email containing this link. This is what you'll be fo focusing on this week. So if <clears throat> here are the de deliverables for your GitHub. If you're working on a database, for example, using parse, creating users, you're gonna have to create a schema. The schema is basically a layout of how your database looks like, like visually. Oh, like this is a user, this is what the user has, this is a post, this is what the post has. So just another, just like a visual way of, of seeing your database. That's a schema. You're gonna put that on your readme, and if you're using APIs, you're gonna to have to also put that on your GitHub README. You're gonna to have to list out the the APIs that you used, the name of it, as well as a link that takes you to it. So for example, if you used Yelp API, you will have something like this, Yelp, and then the, the name of it, and with the name it contains a link, which would take you to Yelp's API. Oh, it's not there anymore. He took it out. But this is an example. So make sure that you um, whatever information that you're using from that API, you got to tell us what you're collecting from that API. For example, um, if I'm using Yelp for searching food, okay, um, I'm only going to search for food. I don't want to get the businesses. So I'm going to create a class that has food. The attributes are going to be restaurants that have it, the rating that these restaurants have, and also what the reviews of like this food that I searched up. I got a list that on my README. Or if I'm using Twitter API, I have, and I only want to search up users, or I want to search up the, the most famous Twitter user accounts right now, um, I'm gonna have to create a class and list out the attributes that that user has. For example, the name, or if I'm only gonna get tweets of that user, then just list out the tweets, okay? And here are some considerations that you can go over. So if you're still stuck on your project, in determining how you're going to implement a certain functionality. If you're stuck and you're confused and you don't know how to do that, I recommend you that you go over this and ask yourself, what do I need to do? Like, why do I, do I even need this? How am I going to implement this into our project? Is it really going to be useful for our end product? Yes, no. And if overall it is part of your MVP or it's part of your core app, features, then yes, include it, implement it, do your best in trying to figure out how to implement that. And lastly, here's a summary of what you're going to be turning in for your GitHub README. So you're going to, um, I guess, you, you don't have to necessarily use GitHub issues for breaking down who's doing what, but if you like using GitHub and you want to know how to use GitHub more extensively, I recommend that you use GitHub issues. It allows you to assign each individual an assignment, like, oh, uh, I'll have this guy work on the front end, I'll have this guy work on user authentication, and you will be working on the database. You can use GitHub issues to assign those tasks. But if not, you can just list them out plain text on your readme file. Just list out which member was doing what work. And once you finish this, Make sure that this week you complete at least one third of your GitHub user stories, the required ones, not the bonus ones, just the required ones, okay? And as you complete them, create a GIF of each required story. For example, if I, if I was working on user authentication, I'm gonna create the GIF 
showing how the user logs in successfully. That's it. Just that GIF for that. And if I'm working, and if another person is working on getting posts from Twitter, then I'll be the one in charge of creating that GIF or that video showing how I successfully load the, tw the tweets. Okay, that's it. You don't need to show us the, the user authentication. The other person did that already. Only show for each GIF what each functionality does. Okay? All right. So that's it for this week. This is what you'll be working on. And a reminder that next week we're going to have demo day, Friday at 5.30 p.m. Does that conflict with anyone? Friday at 5.30 p.m. Hopefully there's no finals. It's week 10. It's usually the dead week. Everyone's just studying or submitting their last projects. It's going to, I will most likely have it HH156 where we have our Monday sessions. Works for you? Yeah. Perfect. Pretty sure it should work for everyone. There's no class on Fridays usually. Yeah. Is this going to be like a typical demo where like we want to focus on aesthetics and like the cover of the app and stuff rather than like the minute functionalities like we test this? It might crash every time we test it. Yeah. Don't sh just cover if you there's if your app is still not working, just cover it up. Okay. Just have a simple demo that works with dummy data if your server is still not working, or a demo version of your app that shows what it should do. So maybe you weren't able to complete it, you can still show your wireframes or your sketches that you made and show how it would be done. But by this, by that time, you guys should have at least a prototype to show off. And focus, do focus on aesthetics because people tend to look more at aesthetics than anything else. Unless you're talking to a machine learning heavy duty engineer, then yeah, they're gonna be like, oh, show me the code. Yeah. <laughs> They're going to look at the code and they're going to fall in love with that. That's like Pattis style engineers. But for, for our purpose, since it's mostly mobile development, we're going to have engineers that focus on both things. The technicalities and also the aesthetics of your app. So make sure you have both. But I highly recommend you try to make it pretty because that will attract the audience a little bit more. And um, I'll send an email reminder about that. Don't worry. Next week we're going to cover how to deploy your app to the App Store. So it'll be our last lecture. And as also, I want to remind you that even though we have a deadline, it doesn't mean that you can't keep working on your app. Like, if you want to keep working on it, working on it. I made it, I finished my app, and then I still polished it after I finished um, my course. And I even, I went back to our hackathon app that we made, and I continued it, completed it, and also pushed that in. And now I have two apps, because why not? So the more the merrier, because the more things you have in your GitHub, the better. It's just going to look more professional on your end. And also, we hope that you kept um, the way that you organize your GitHub README. That's how you should organize your future projects. If you're going to create a project that does something, list out what you do, what you did, what it does, and even a walkthrough. A walkthrough is really, really useful when engineers or recruiters are looking at your profile. Um, cause I heard one of our students got a job offer from Omada Health and I'm telling you guys, he, he applied this quarter and he, he got it like during this quarter, you know what they asked him on the interview? They asked him basically how to make flicks all over again. They gave him an API. They're, they're like, all right, here's an API. It gets you food items from this source. Um, just make a table view and show us how to list out these things from the API. He's like, all right, easy money, I got you. <laughs> they paired him up with an engineer, and while going to the interview, they asked him questions along the way, like, oh, why are you casting it as this food cell? Like, what, why, what does that do? Or like, why, is it, why do you do that? And also, oh, what does this function do? The func table view did select row, or the func cell for view at. It's basically all the stuff that I've been teaching you guys so far. And that's what they, that, those are the kinds of questions they ask them. That's why we have these lectures, so you guys know exactly why we do certain every step by step, so that you guys do the same during the interview. And don't be scared to apply. Apply right now. There's still jobs out there. If you want to know the company, it's uh, this is the company that student got in. So it's in San Francisco. I, I don't know exactly what they do, but I think.
think it's an app that mo like monitors your health. It's sort of like the Apple Health, but more integrated, like with your cholesterol levels, heart level, I think. And it shows you what to do if anything is like going off. But um, yeah, you guys should start applying. I'm telling you, you guys, I'm teaching you content that basically by the end of next week, you guys will learn how to be, you will have become a full stack iOS engineer. Literally, like no kidding. You guys learn, know APIs, table views, how to display information, how to set up your own server. We taught you a course that you guys would typically learn in about one year and a half here at UCI because you have to take Python. Once you say Python, you have to take 122A and then you have to take 122B, which is web apps. So that's five quarters, one year and a half. Here, you literally learn everything in one quarter. So it's pretty condensed, very intense too, but it gets you going. So, and regarding the scholarships, I was not joking as well. I got a scholarship, but CodePath also gives scholarships to students. So keep up with your grades. I know it's like one week. So make sure you polish up your app and make it really good because they will be contacting the best performing students to attend either the summer's uh, app demo or even just select you for a scholarship and interview you and everything and also as well as for the other benefits that I told you about, like the VIP <clears throat> um, job search day, like sort of, yeah, I forgot what it's called, but <clears throat> you know what it is. So let's get a head start and take attendance. I'm pretty sure no one else is going to come in right now. So here's today's court, course code schema. And I know most of you have done this, but if you know someone who hasn't done the, this mid-course review uh, survey, please do it. I need you guys to do this because we need it. We need to know how we're doing. So if you know anyone who hasn't, who hasn't done this survey, please tell them to do it. Okay? All right. Everybody's done with attendance? All right. I'm going to close this. So again, this week... No more course portal. The only time you're going to use a course portal is to submit your milestones. Why is this that? So you're going to use the submit button to submit. Oh, I can't submit anymore. Huh. You're gonna you're going to submit through unit eight again this week's milestones. Okay. So hopefully I, I that's going to confuse people that didn't come today or yesterday. But make sure you submit through this button right here. All right. Make sure you tell your group teammates so that they know. And next week again, we'll have you submit it also through the same unit eight, most likely. All right, that's it for, for the presentation. Let's get to coding. So today we're gonna to be learning animations. It's one of the last lectures and the last technical iOS lectures for this quarter. And what we're going to be doing is learn how to play around with iOS gestures. So one example is the pan gesture, which allows you to tap and drag something on the screen. And then the other gesture is the, the pinch. So that's like when you zoom in and out of an app. An example is like from here. We, we're going to use a pinch to make this object bigger or smaller. And then we also go, we're also going to go through rotating. Oh. When you pinch, but instead of zooming in and out, now you're going to like rotate something. It's kind of hard doing it on the simulator, but I swear I was working yesterday. Yeah, it's kind of hard. Let me try it. There we go. Yeah, we're going to learn how to do rotate also. And then we're also going to learn tap. And here I use double tap because if I don't do two taps, it's going to get confused with the pan gesture. So I made it two taps, and what I made it do is it'll go run. Same with the Mario, I can drag him and make him go run. Look at him go. Yeah. All right, and then we're going to also go over the one of the other gestures, which is long press. And what this app will do is if you long press the background, it'll reset all the characters back to where they were. Cool. Let's go ahead and open up our starter project.
Ups. And there we go. All right. I'm just going to open up a new tab. Here we are. So let's go ahead and get started with the basic, the layout. So what are we going to be viewing? We need to first the background and we also need to add the characters in our little animation game. So we're going to go ahead and add the UI image view for the background. Go ahead and drag and drop into your storyboard. And we want this to cover the whole screen. So let's add some constraints to it so that it can fill up the entire screen. There we go. Now that I have it full, I need the actual image. So if you go over to your assets, you'll notice that I've already included the assets that we're going to be using for our app. So we just need to call this background and replace our the UI image that we created over here and replace that with the background. So if you go to your attributes inspector, you'll notice this image um, text field and what it takes is it takes an input from one of your assets. So we're here, we're going to give it the background image, which is a name of our file. There we go. And once you give it the name, it'll pop up with the image that you had placed from your assets file. Perfect. Now that we have that, let's go ahead and add the carts. We're going to do the same thing with the carts. We're going to add UI image views. And we're going to replace the image with a the carts. And here I'm going to put card zero. And you can see that it's a little warped. It looks pretty messed up. So let's fix that by changing the content mode and switching this to aspect fit. This is going to allow us our, our character to look normal all the time. Boom. There you go. Now he looks normal by changing it to aspect fit. And now I can just resize this and you can see that the image maintains consistency. It does not change the, it won't flatten out or get stretched out. It'll maintain its size and shape. So now let's do the same for all the other carts. But since I, would, I don't want to add an object and change the file name and everything, I'm just going to copy and paste this guy. There we go. There we go. Perfect. I copied and pasted Bowser, and now I'm just going to change the cart name to cart1. And let's change this one to cart2. There we go. Awesome. So now we have our characters going around, right? Now we need to set up some of the functionalities to our animations. The first one we're going to go over is pan gesture. So go ahead and search up pan, and you you're going to see the first option that pops up, which is the pan gesture recognizer. Here, we're going to drag that pan gesture recognizer and insert it into the image or the characters that are going to be um, reacting to our pan gesture. Boom. And we're going to do the same for all three characters. Perfect. So now that we created our pan gesture, now we need to make some outlets and connect these gestures into our app. Open up the view controller on another on the side. And here we're going to let me make this smaller. I'm going to drag and drop the pan gesture recognizer onto my view controller file. And here I'm gonna for the fu uh, the function name I'm gonna call it did pan cart view. For the type it's gonna be different. Here it's no longer gonna be any. We're gonna change it to a UI pan gesture recognizer. So make sure that you change that to this type, and then you connect it. There we go. And now to connect the other ones, you won't have to create another function you connect all the other gestures to the same function. So in other words, I'm going to drag and drop to what I've, the function that I've already created, like this. There you go. So that way I don't have to recreate the same function over and over again. Perfect. 
All right, so if we go into our view controller, we have our function right here. Make sure that it's a, the sender is a pan gesture recognizer. If you don't see that, reconnect them and make sure that it's a UI pan gesture recognizer type. All right. So now what do we want to do with the pan gesture? What we want to do with this function is we want to move carts as we, we just move the carts. I'm just going to type that. And in order to do that, first we need to get the location of where the cart is located. So we're going to create a variable called location, and it's going to be the sender location in view. What this is doing is the sender is the pan gesture recognizer. So as soon as our app detects a tap or a pan on our app, it's going to detect the location of where it's being tapped. And using that location, we want to use that variable or those coordinates to move our cart view. So now that we have our location, we need to get the cart view that we're going to modify. We're going to create a variable cart view equals sender.view. Here, it's going to recognize which cart view was tapped on. So if I tapped on the Bowser cart, it's going to detect that I tapped on that one. And now we need to modify the location of the cart view. To do that, we're going to access the cart views center equals to location. So here we're getting location from user tap or user pan. And here we're accessing the cart that was ta uh, panned. And then lastly, modify the location of cart. Perfect. So now that we have that, if you run it, it will not work because there was this issue that I had for like, like an hour trying to figure out why it wasn't working. But it's because of this stupid button right here that says allow user interaction. So if you don't have that enabled, it's not going to work. So make sure you guys have this on all your carts, including the background. There you go. So make sure you click on that option, and now try running it, and we'll see what happens. Here it is. All right, so try dragging, click, click, hold, and drag it somewhere else. There you go. It's moving. On your phone, it should run more smoothly, but because it's a simulator, it's like super laggy. But on your phone, it should look more like this. Like you can see where it's going. But for now, it's super laggy, so it looks like that. But this is what you should be able to be doing right now. There you go. All right, it works. Let's implement our next gesture. Let's implement pinch so that we can increase the size of our carts. Go ahead and get the pinch gesture recognizer and drag and do the same thing as we did before. Drag and drop them into the images. There we go. And now we're going to repeat the process that we did earlier. We're going to open up our view controller and connect our pinch gesture recognizer. And I'm going to call it did pinch cart view. And remember to set the type equal to UI pinch gesture recognizer. There we go. Perfect. Once you've finished that, let's go ahead and modify our function to perform the logic that we want it to. So in this case, now we want to, when we zoom in and out from our app or the cart that we select, we want to increase the size of it. But in other words, 
Swift recognizes sizes as scale. So in here we're going to create a variable called scale. And we're going to access the scale property from the UI pinch gesture recognizer. And same thing as we did before, we need the cart that we're going to modify. And we, now we need to modify the scale of our cart view. In order to do that, you're going to call cart view dot transform equals to CG affine transform. And here you're going to have a couple options here. And obviously we're going to use the one that modifies the scale. So here we have one for us that says scale X and Y. So we're going to use that function to modify the scale of our object. And here you, for the scale X, you're going to put in the scale as well as for the Y. There you go. So same thing as before, access scale property of, of a pinch. And then we get the cart view that we're going to modify. Modify cart views scale. Or also known as size. There we go. Now we know what this function does. Now let's try running this one and see if it works. Perfect. So we have our carts going here. So this is this one is kind of tricky because when you in order to activate the pinch on your simulator, you have to hold the Alt Option key and you'll see these two dots pop up. This is the pinch gesture recognizer. And then while you click, you gotta hold it and then move it along. And for some reason it does this with like, it, it gets both. And I don't know why, it, um, sometimes it's, yeah, it's pretty creepy. But I just want to zoom in. So in order to zoom in, make sure you put him on the center and then try, try zooming him out. It's kind of hard, but let me try it. No? Did it work for any of you? Yeah? Okay. Yeah, it should be able to it should be able to transform the size of our cart view. But if it didn't, then just just try it on your phone. It'll be way better. It's kind of hard. Usually it works with Bowser. I don't know why. I guess it's because he's fat. Let me try it. Yeah, you see? With Bowser it works all the time. There we go. Yeah. Try with Bowser. It'll work better. All right. Let's go ahead and add the, um, let's see, which one should we add next? Let's add the racing gesture. Or it's not a racing gesture, but now let's make our carts race. So this time we're going to add what's called the tap gesture. Oops. All right, now we're going to add the tap, tab gesture, and you guys already know the steps. Follow along with me. Let's go ahead and add those tab gestures to our images. And same thing, let's open up our view controller and create the file for our tap. Did tap cart view. Oops. And again, make sure that it's a tap, a UI tap gesture recognizer. There we go. Question? Can you change the type of action in um, Austin when you click on the arrow button? The type? No. Because no. that one's just a button. Okay. When it's a normal button, it can be any. And what you do there is that the reason why it's any is because any refers to any action that you want it to do. But in this case, we're not accessing any action. We're accessing the actions provided by pinch gesture recognizer, hand gesture recognizer, and the tap gesture recognizer. Each one of these has methods that come with it. For example, 
the pin gesture, gesture recognizer has a scale method, which allows you to modify things, the, the, the scale bit. The pan allows you to mark where the location of your finger is. So if you were to do a game or something, and if you want to move like characters, or like do the, remember Pokemon Go? You need pan gesture recognizer to move the, the Pokeball and throw it. And once you let go, it'll, this is where you would put something like, oh, if the, if the, if there's no longer a finger in there, throw it. And, uh, what's another one? On the map, you, it's, uh, the map class derives from the UI pin gesture, gesture recognizer. It includes the method of scale so that it modifies the map. So that you can zoom in and out. Um, what's another one? Ah. You can use a tab gesture recognizer for like, for example, when you want to, um, what's a game? What's a game that works with tab? Oh, you can set, the, have you guys played piano tiles? You can use tab gesture recognizer and you can set moving objects and as they come down to the screen, you get the tab also allows you to access the location. So all you do is you set the location equal to the location of the piano tile that's coming. And if they match, or if it's inside the box of coordinates, then it'll return you a true and boom, it'll play the sound. Simple stuff like that. But this is the basics of the methods from each gesture recognizer. Any is for like buttons. For like signing up button or like login button. Yeah? Question? So like for location, is it like right when you tap or is it does it follow along right when you're clicking? For the tap, so if you were to print the location, it will follow along. It will print a long list of all the locations where your finger was. Tap, it, it will only print it once because you tapped it. But the pan gesture recognizer is basically when you tap and drag and drop anywhere with your finger. Tap only allows you to like just tap the screen once and that's it. It won't do anything else. You can't drag anything. So in here, what we want is to make sure you go on your storyboard and set the taps to number of two taps. So that we don't, because we don't want our app to get confused with the pan gesture recognizer. Because the pan gesture recognizer takes in one tap and then you modify, you, you move along with your finger. So make sure on your tab gesture recognizer storyboard, change the rec the the recognized taps to two, or else it'll give you some weird errors going on. There we go. All right. So now that you have that ready, now let's set up the logic for our tap. So when the user taps on the cart twice, we want the cart to just drive off. So in here, it's a little bit different. We're not going to do much. We're going to get the cart view as always. And now we're going to access a method of UI views called animate. UI view dot animate and duration. We're going to animate our object for 0 0.008 seconds. 0 0.8 seconds. And the animation takes in a method. And this method can be in a closure. So we're going to create our own closure. And what we want it to do for 0.8 seconds is we want the cart to move across the screen fast. So what we're going to do is we're going to call the cart view dot center dot x plus equals 400. So what does this do? If you recall from Algebra 2 graphs, if you move along a horizontal axis, or in other words, the x-axis, we want our cart to move horizontally, right? So we're just going to make the cart move all the way across 400 coordinates, spaces, or units, whatever it is that Swift uses. So what we're doing for 0.8 seconds is we're having our cart move on the x-axis 400 spaces. And if you recall, our screen is only 217 pixels, so 400 is obviously going to be way off the screen. That way we can ensure that it's always outside the screen, unless it's an iPad. If it's an iPad, you're going to need more. But in this case, we're just going to use 400. All right, so let's run this and see what happens.
Let me double tap him, Bowser, because I don't like him. There you go. He, he dipped. Let's try it with Toad. Oh, oh, did I forget to add him? Yeah. I forgot to connect him. My bad. Let me connect my function. There we go. For some reason, yesterday I called Toad Shrooms because I forgot. <laughs> cause I, for, I forgot the name of Toad, so I was like, "Shrooms," and then they're like, "What?" They got so confused yesterday, but it was hilarious. But anyhow, let's see. Let's see if they all work now. There you go. Cool. They all move now. Awesome. So if you guys want to do more with it, like for example, if you want the cart to do like a wheelie, that would be cool. All you should do is you transform. Oh, actually, I'll show you guys later on. It'll be a bonus for you guys. But now let's, I'm going to, since you guys know the basics of some of these, I'm going to ask you guys to implement the rotation, the rotation gesture. So I'll give you guys five minutes, and I want you guys to implement the rotation gesture. So same stuff, um, just implement it, and uh, let me know if you guys figure it out. And I'll give you a hint. The rotation is similar to the pinch. Okay? So try it out. See if you can figure it out. Were you guys able to figure it out? Yeah? Awesome. So essentially, if you guys weren't able to figure it out, let's go through it. We get the rotation from our gesture recognizer, the rotation gesture recognizer. And, whoops, sender.rotation. And then we get the cart view that we want to modify, the usual. And now we're going to modify it the cart view by trans through the transform method. And we're going to modify what's called the rotation angle. This is what's going to allow us to modify it. And you're going to pass in the rotation as a parameter. There we go. So now that you know how to rotate and also how to make the cart move, now you have the basic tools to make a wheelie on your cart right at the beginning, right? All you would need to do is make the rotation go up and then go down after a couple seconds. So I'll give you guys a hint for that. But if you guys want to do that as a bonus, feel free to do that. I'm not going to go over it today. I'm going to go over the, the last step today, which is now we're going to go over long press, how to reset our carts. 
because if we uh, if we were to run our application, you'll notice that once we pr double press our carts, they're going to be gone. They're going to disappear, and you can't. You're going to have to restart your own application again, and that kind of sucks because we don't want that. We want everything to be able to be done here. So let's implement a long press gesture. Oops. So go ahead and find on your object library long press gesture recognizer. And this time, we're going to put it on the background image. There you go. So every time that the user long presses the background, we want our carts to reset to the original position that they were. So in order to do that, let's go ahead and add that function to our view controller. And here I'm just I'm gonna set the name for it did long tap did long press background. Alright, so now is the tricky part. How does Swift know where things are located when you first launch the application? How will we go about this? Well, we create variables to store data for it. So let's create some variables to store the initial location of our images, or in other words, our carts. And I'm going to call them starting point cart zero. So this is going to be a coordinate. This variable is going to hold the coordinate, the initial coordinate of my first cart, the initial coordinate, where it was started when I launched my app. And it's going to take in a CG point. And I'm going to copy and paste because I'm lazy and do the same for all my other carts. Cart one and cart two. There you go. So now I know where they start. And now all I want to do next is when I launch my application, I want to change these variables to the coordinates of where my current carts are located. Because you know how every time I launch it, they start off at that same spot. I want to access that coordinate where they start off. In order to do that, we're going to have to connect our UI images, or in other words, our carts, into outlets right here. So let's go ahead and open up our storyboard and create outlets. This time we're going to create outlets for our carts, our image views. So go all the way up and add your cart views right here. This is going to be cart zero. Cart view zero. And do the same for all the others. Cart view one. And a cart view two. There you go. So now that we have our cart views, now we need to access their, in, their initial location right after we launch our app, which is under the view did load. So let's go ahead and modify our variables, the starting point equal to the starting point coordinates of our cart views. Go ahead and call the starting point cart zero. Set that equal to the cart view zero dot center. That's it. And that's how you get the coordinates of where your initial cart was located when you initialize your app. And since we're lazy, let's go ahead and copy and paste them for the rest of our cart views. There we go. And now, for the long press, now that we have a, now that we know where our cart started at the beginning, let's go ahead and modify our long press background and set the starting point, set our cart view center to the starting point where they were. So easy peasy, self dot cart view zero. See, Derek, take this. Dot center 
equal to the self dot starting point part zero there we go and you do the same thing for all the others there we go now let's run it and see what happens So if I move these guys out, out here, I let Toad go, and move this guy over here. If I do a long press, they should be going back to where they were. There you go. But you guys notice that it was kind of funky, right? Because they just popped out of nowhere. Like, they're gone, and then boom. So let's make this prettier. And also, if you guys notice, if you guys edit the size of Bowser and I long press, You'll notice that he's re his position is back, but his size is like way bigger. So we want to know how we can, when we long press, make his scale normal again. So let's implement that functionality to our long press. So what we're going to do is we're going to use animation again. Let's call uiView.animate and with duration of 0 0.8 seconds and during that time frame we're going to center back our cart views to where they were originally and we're, we also want to set their scale back to their original scale so in order to do that you're going to call the self dot cart view dot transform and all you do is you access what's called the CG affine transform dot identity. This method basically accesses the original image size and rotation of when you put your content in your app. And you do the same for all three carts, cart one and cart two. So now what we're doing is we're going to smoothen out our transitions of our carts so that when we long press our app, it will go back to their spots and their original sizes in a nicely and more user-friendly way. So let's run our app and try it out. Alright, so these guys are gone. Let's see if I long press it. There we go. That looks way nicer. You guys saw that? Yeah. So if I move these guys and I long press it, you see now with using animation, it, our transition looks way nicer. So, and if we try to resize it, let's see what happens. Or rotate it as well. If we reset them back, you'll see that it resets its rotation and scale of it. Cool. That is it for today. I wanted this to be a short lecture because it's a fun lecture. And I know you guys are probably tired already of learning heavy-duty iOS stuff. So we learned something cool, fun, and also a nice feature to have in your apps for when you're doing animations or transitioning to other things that you're working in your app. So what's going to happen next? So next week, don't forget, demo day is a Friday, 5.30 p.m. It'll be most likely in HH156, which is where I have my Monday sessions. If it changes, I will, guide, I will let you guys know if the day changes or the time changes for demo day. Other than that, everything is the same. And a recap on the homework. Remember that your homework is this file that I sent you guys through email. I will send it again just in case. And if you want to recap on some of the videos that we've learned, make sure to use um, our website that we have. I've been uploading our videos here for our lectures. So if you guys are stuck on something, make sure to check it out. I've uploaded our videos through here. So you guys can, like, if you want to know how to implement parse or you forgot how to do map kit, I have everything here. So that you guys can go back and see how to do map kit, how to do parse, etc. All right? And if you also get stuck, 
or if you want to learn something new, you can go to guides.codepath.com slash iOS. And here we have a full on guide on everything. If you want to learn maps, you can learn maps here. It'll show you everything about maps. If you want to learn WebKit, it has WebKit also. Parse, you can, you can learn more about parse here. Okay, so remember these resources that you guys have, because I think they took them off from the course portal. I don't know why. And as always, you also have the discussion system to use, so you're not alone. And also, I'll be having office, fri uh, office hours Friday if you guys need any help on your final features that you want to implement. Cool. You guys are free to go. I hope you guys have enjoyed learning iOS so far. All right.